All right, very good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you in the new year. New academic year, I mean. Uh, all right, so what I want to do today is to talk about, um, let's say, some a little bit more advanced topics on muscle and bone. So you are now in the course about locomotion. So we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about the biochemistry of uh, skeletal muscle mainly and the bone. So we're going to be building on the stuff that we did together last year. I'm going to briefly review it in the beginning. And then we're going to uh, talk about the muscle more uh, from the perspective of its energy metabolism, what kind of substrates it uses, how it switches between substrates depending on load, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the regulation of uh, both metabolism and growth of the muscle. And in the second half of the lecture, we're going to talk about bone as a, to some extent, as a metabolic organ as well. Uh, but mostly there, we're going to be discussing the communication between the different types of cells and how the metabolism of the bone is regulated. So how bone is, how it grows, how it's degraded, and how these things are regulated. So that's going to be uh, the topic for today. All right. So last year we talked at length about muscle, uh, mainly about muscle contraction, its mechanism, and how it's regulated, and how it started, etc. So can you tell me how the whole thing starts? Let's talk about skeletal muscle. Okay, let's talk about skeletal muscle. So how is, what is the stimulus for contraction, and how is it coupled to the actual contraction? How does it work in skeletal muscle? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Acetylcholine receptors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So these acetylcholine receptors are what type of receptors? Anybody remembers the name? They are ligand gated. What? Okay, ligand gated sodium channels. Very good. And what is the name of the subtype of acetylcholine receptors? These ionotropic receptors. Nicotinic. Yeah, very good. They're nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are the neuromuscular junction, the sarcolemma. Uh, sodium goes in as they open. Okay, so the membrane depolarizes. Very good. And then what happens? <coughs> Just like that, by magic. Oh, there, there are various channels. And what kind of channels do we need for the action potential on the muscle to actually propagate along the sarcolemma? We need voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so a big difference between ligand-gated sodium channels, which are the acetylcholine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and voltage-gated sodium channels. What's the difference? One is stimulated by uh, ligand, mm -hmm. by the receptor, and the other one is stimulated by the change of the, uh, of the potential across the membrane. Very good. Okay, excellent. So voltage-gated sodium channels propagate the de depolarization along the sarcolemma, and it goes well, on the sarcolemma into, for example, into T2-builds as well. What are T2-builds? What are they? The okay, they're just invaginations of the membrane. They're surrounded by some other structures. All right, what happens there? Then there's two channels in the T2-builds that need to be connected. The, I mean, the, I think it's the and the uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so there are dihydropyridine receptors and ryanodine receptors, which in fact are ion channels. For which ion? For calcium. Okay, so they're calcium channels. But you said that both of them are in the T tubule, but that's not quite right. Why isn't the endoplasmic reticulum? And which one? Sarcolemma. So one is in the sarcolemma. And the other one is in the cistern of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Which one is which? The is on the 
on the sarcolemma, very good. And it is in fact a voltage gated calcium channel. Okay, so it opens, it changes conformation upon depolarization. And this change in conformation is physically transferred onto, to, onto the ryanodine receptor type one on the, sarco, on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then opens and releases calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. As the calcium concentration in the cytoplasm and the sarcoplasm uh, increases, what happens then? Very good. So there's troponin C, which is part of the of a complex which we call the tropomycin. tropomycin is part of that. Troponin. troponin, tropomyosin complex. Very good. Lots of different proteins. Well, at least four anyway. <laughs> okay. And troponin C binds the increased the the ions of calcium that appear in the in the sarcoplasm, changes conformation, changes conformation of the whole complex. And as you correctly said, it unmasks the binding sites four miles in on actin. Then what happens? Then what happens? Yes. And then the myosin can bind to the actin cell. Very good. Yeah. So myosin head binds to actin. And what is released? Okay, okay. So ADP is released. The, the myosin head, basically the angle between the tail and the head goes back to the original, the relaxed position, which creates the power stroke that moves actin against myosin. Okay, and then what happens? Okay, and then phosphate is released. Okay, then ATP binds again. And then well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but then ATP binds. And it resets the, the conformation of the... Yes, it does, but first... It detaches, okay, so it detaches from actin as it binds ATP. Then it's restored to the not relaxed, the tense conformation, okay, and the whole cycle repeats, it hydrolyzes, etc., etc. Okay, and this just keeps happening as long as there is increased calcium, okay? So this is a cycle. You remember from last year's structure lectures, myosin has a lot of, the myosin fibril has a lot of uh, heads, myosin heads, so they kind of keep walking along the actin and the muscle contracts, okay, macroscopically, okay? But of course, the contraction needs to end at some point, well, at least in normally functioning human body. How does that work? Somebody who hasn't somebody who hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> yeah, everybody started looking into their notes. Um, okay, somebody from the back. You didn't hear the question, did you? Uh, what? Yes. Is calcium really used? For the contraction? Does it go away? Does it disappear? Is it consumed? It is, that is true. So it sits there and allows the contraction. But how do we stop it? Okay, so there, there is a pump that pumps continuously, pumps calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But of course, first we need to stop the membrane depolarization. Because if we don't stop that, if the membrane keeps being depolarized, calcium will still be leaking out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the contraction will continue. So first we need to stop the signal, which usually means that the nerve ending stops sending acetylcholine. The membrane starts repolarizing and then the calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the whole thing stops because tropomyosin moves back into the blocking position and the contraction stops. All right? Good. So this was just a quick review of, of uh, muscle contraction. And of course, even though we did it last year, it's something that we expect you to know even this year and maybe even next year. Um, so it's, it's important that you know these, uh, these mechanisms and we will ask about them in the exam and elsewhere. All right?
Good. So I promise that today we're going to be mostly talking about metabolism, about what kind of substrates uh, muscle uses. But we talked about it last year a little bit. So if we say energy substrates, or what kind of substrates um, um, muscle uses for this contraction, what would your answers be, or guesses, if not answers? Okay, so there's glycogen. Okay, this is glycogen. Where where is glycogen? Is it? Hmm? Okay, so most glycogen in our body is stored in the liver and the muscle. So if we talk about glycogen as a source of energy for the muscle, which glycogen we're we talking about? The muscle glycogen. Okay, so mostly, I mean, we could sort of think about the liver uh, glycogen as well, but let's let's talk about muscle glycogen. All right, so glycogen is itself not a, an energy substrate. It's actually a, it's a storage form for glucose. Very good, okay? So glycogen gets broken down by glycogen phosphorylase. And does anyone remember what the product is of this reaction? Well, no. It's glucose 1-phosphate, okay? So it needs to be turned. <coughs> to glucose 6-phosphate. Now, there is something very important about muscle uh, with respect to glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, very good. So it doesn't release the glucose. Very good, okay, so there's no glucose 6-phosphatase. So this glucose 6-phosphate from glucose 1-phosphate from glycogen phos uh, phosphorylase reaction cannot be released into the bloodstream. Very important, because when we talk about the regulation of blood glucose, uh, this is very important to know that muscle, skeletal muscle cannot be a source of glucose for the rest of the body, at least not directly. Of course, there are indirect ways for that. All right, so when we say glycogen, what we mean as a, as a substrate, we mean glucose. This glucose can come from glycogen, correct, but it can also come from... If we talk about muscle using glucose, so some of it may come from glycogen, from muscle glycogen, but it can also come from hmm? glucose. Okay. Yes, but that's fairly complicated. Okay, we'll get to that maybe, but so I'll rephrase that. A muscle fiber needs glucose. It can get it from its glycogen or it can get it from the blood. Right? We can get it from the blood. Okay, there's plenty of glucose in the blood, so we can get it from the blood. How can we get glucose from the blood? What do we, what do we need for that? Hmm? And what, so, sorry? Uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't catch the beginning. Oh, okay, okay. Glut, transport, okay, glucose transporters. Okay, very good. Um, what kind of transporters are these? Glut transporters? Mm, some of them are, some of them aren't. Are they active, passive? Hmm? No, they're not, no. Okay, they're passive transporters. They're the channels for glucose. They're translocators of glucose, but they, they are not active. Not primarily active, not secondarily active, okay? The secondary active transporters for glucose are called SGLT. Okay, and they are present only in very special tissues, namely, no, huh? Okay, so in the kidneys, very good. And we will talk about it this year in much more detail, but they're also in the intestines, okay? So they are used to absorb glucose when there's not enough of that. So in the muscle, we're talking about glute transporters, which are passive, <coughs> trans passive transporters. Now you mentioned that they are hormone sensitive. Not all of them are, but when we talk about hormone sensitive glute transporters, what do we mean by that? Which, we usually talk about glute four, and to which hormone are they sensitive? They're sensitive to insulin. Very good, okay, they're sensitive to insulin. Now, this is something I mentioned last year as well. So the important thing is not to think of GLUT4 transporters as being insulin dependent, okay? Some people say that they are insulin dependent. We need insulin to have GLUT4 on the membrane. This is not true, they are insulin sensitive. So insulin can bring them up to the membrane 
okay, increase the numbers on the, on the membrane, but they are not insulin dependent. A very easy example of that, imagine that this morning you didn't have breakfast and you wanted to run to catch a bus. Okay? Your muscles will need some amount of glucose, probably from the blood, okay? but they don't have any insulin, right? There's no insulin, you didn't eat in the morning. Okay? There's no insulin in the bloodstream, but your muscles still must have a way to get at least some glucose from the blood. So there are other methods for the muscle to put GLUT4 on the membrane if they need it, okay? And there are two types of regulations for that. So if we have GLUT4, okay? We're still talking about metabolism of glucose in the muscle, okay? So we're just going through different parts of that. So GLUT4, as you correctly said, one possible regulation is through insulin, but in which situation is this important? We're talking skeletal muscle, glucose, and insulin. So what kind of situation of the body in fat state? So after a meal, okay, we need to get rid, not get rid, but store all the glucose that just has been absorbed from the intestines. So insulin is released from the pancreatic beta cells, lots of GLUT4 goes up on the membrane, and the glucose gets sucked into the muscle and stored in glycogen or whatever. Okay, so that's, a, that's one special situation. But there are many other situations where we don't have insulin, where this situation does not happen at all, but the muscle still needs glucose. And for that, we have two main signals. One is calcium. So it's obvious when there is muscle contraction happening, there must be more calcium in the sarcoplasm, right? That's what we just said, that's the regulation of contraction. So this increased calcium also serves as a signal for increased GLUT4 expression so that the muscle can be getting enough glucose for the contraction, okay? This is actually through calmodulin-dependent kinase. So there's a kinase which binds calcium through calmodulin. <laughs> phosphorylates lots of proteins and gets GLUT4 on the membrane. The other regulator of GLUT4 and a lot of metabolism in the muscle is an enzyme that we talked about briefly last year. It's called AMPK, which stands for, does anyone know? Okay, adenosine monophosphate dependent kinase. Okay, so it's, it's a kinase which responds to increased amounts of adenosine monophosphate. If there is an increased amount of adenosine monophosphate in the, in the cell, what does it say about the status? Hmm? There's no energy. Yes, well, more specifically, no ATP. Okay, so levels of ATP are getting very, very low. So most of the ADP that was left gets turned to AMP and ATP through the adenylate kinase reaction. Does it ring a bell? Yeah, okay. Um, so as you say correctly, if, if the cell is running out of ATP, the, the amount of AMP is going to increase. AMP kinase will be activated, and AMP kinase is a very, very important switch in all the cells, not just in the muscle, which tells the cell there's not enough ATP, we have to start doing something, okay? Here, one of the effects is that more GLUT4 is put on the membrane to get more glucose, okay? So these, these are the main mechanisms how we can get glucose into the muscle. The rest of the metabolism of glucose in the muscle is something that we talked about last year, so there's nothing mysterious about that. One possible pathway, well, what are the possible fates of glucose in any cell, and particularly the muscle? What can we do with glucose, <coughs> metabolically speaking? Okay, so we can put it into glycogen, which mostly happens in the fed state with lots of insulin, right? Okay, the muscle is not working, there's just plenty of glucose coming in, we can store it in glycogen. Very good, one possibility. Okay, or it can go into a metabolic pathway called glycolysis, and the final product of glycolysis is pyruvate, okay? And then we have two fates for pyruvate. Either it goes in the, into the Krebs cycle, in the mitochondria, and can get completely oxidized, lots of ATP, or it can get turned into lactic acid 
in what we call anaerobic glycolysis, okay, although it may not be anaerobic in this case. And that produces far less ATP, but it's also useful in situations when, when there's not enough oxygen. Okay? Usually there's some oxygen around, but not enough oxygen to actually keep the rest of it going. Both of these processes do occur in skeletal muscle. Okay? And you, obviously we talked about it last year, and you've heard about lactic acid in the muscles, and it hurts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what determines what are the factors that determine whether glucose in the muscle will be used aerobically through Krebs cycle and, and the respiratory chain or anaerobically? Again, something that we mentioned a little bit last year. There are two main factors that determine that. Hmm? Very good. So one is the fiber type. Okay, muscle type, yeah, okay, but it's the type of the muscle fiber. And does anyone remember the types that we have in our skeletal muscles? Okay, red and white is one way of describing them. Okay, when you look under microscope, this is what you see. But last year we spoke about three types of fibers. One. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not one, two, three, huh? Okay, there's 2A and 2X, very good. Okay, in, in old liter literature you can find 2B, but actually they are not 2B fibers, they're actually 2X fibers, okay, for some reasons, okay. This classification is actually based on the type of myosin heavy chain that is expressed in those muscle fibers, okay. So that's why they're 2X and not 2B. Metabolically speaking, as you said, white and red, or we can say glycolytic and aerobic, how does it work with these fibers? Which are the ones that are primarily oxidative and very red and slow, and which ones are the very fast and primarily glycolytic? Anyone remember? The white are the fast, the white are the fast yes, uh, but with these notations? One. Are what? They are actually the slow ones, red ones, and oxidative ones are type one. And as we go down, they become glycolytic, fast, and white. So two eggs are the whitest fibers, okay? Very, very quick, but primarily glycolytic, and they get fatigued very, very quickly, okay? So we can find these fibers in high abundance in muscles that need to move very quickly, but not for very long, okay? On the other hand, type 1 fibers can be in postural muscles, which just need to be working all the time to keep us upright, okay? But they don't really have to work very fast normally. But of course, most muscles, or almost all muscles, have a mixture of these fibers, so it's not that there are, you know, muscle groups or whatever that would just have one type of fiber. They are mixed together. All right, so one thing that determines whether the, uh, the fiber, the cell, is going to be used glucose glycolytically or oxidatively is the type of the fiber, okay? Which also says how many mitochondria there are, how much myoglobin there is, et cetera, et cetera, how many glycolytic enzymes are there. What is the other factor that determines whether the, the way glucose is going to be used? Okay, the availability of oxygen, uh, okay, to some extent, of course. There are situations where literally there's not enough oxygen. But in most situations, this doesn't really happen, that the, mus that the muscle wouldn't have oxygen, enough oxygen to, to run the, uh, the oxidative metabolism. The other factor that determines not only the fate of glucose, but also the amount of glucose that is going to be used, is the load on the muscle, okay? So the bigger the load, the more glucose is used. And in some very, very extreme loads, a lot of it, especially for a very short time, a lot of it is going to be through, uh, through glycolysis and not the oxidative metabolism. Okay? Most muscles cannot really tolerate this for a very long time. Okay? But in extreme loads, they can run anaerobically because there are some advantages to, to doing that. Okay? One is, that the oxidative met metabolism tends to be slower. It takes some time to, to rev up, 
okay, to increase the rate because all the, the metabolic flows that needs to be transported into mitochondria, etc. So it takes, it takes time to start. And if you have to sprint very quickly or hit somebody or something like that, okay, there's usually not enough time for the muscle to do this. Okay? So the load, the, the speed of the reaction that you, have to, that you have to do also determines whether it's going to be primarily anaerobic or aerobic. All right. The product of the aerobic metabolism is what? Of glucose. Hmm? The whole thing, aerobic. Carbon dioxide, water, okay? Which just get excreted into the blood, and that's easy. The product of the anaerobic pathway is lactate, all right? What happens to lactate from the muscle? So one possibility is that it's released into the bloodstream, goes into primarily liver, okay? And can get, glucon through gluconeogenesis, can get turned back to glucose, okay? And we have a cycle which is called the Cori cycle, okay? Very good, so that's one possible fate. What other possible fates for lactate from skeletal muscle can we have? It stays there, just forever, or? Why, I mean, why, why did you say it stays there? Or did you? All right. Okay. 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 So sometimes it's slow to be released or slow to be metabolized, of course, and stays there for a while. It hurts. Okay. Fine. Yes. It's not really a fate, but it's a possible, yeah, transitional thing. Are there other organs in the body that can take lactate as a main or an important substrate? Hmm? Erythrocytes are producing lactate, but they can't really use it because they don't have mitochondria, okay? So they can't metabolize lactate, they produce it. But there's one important muscly organ, heart. heart, okay? For the heart, lactate is an important energy substrate, okay? So it can, re it can oxidize some of the lactate which is released into the bloodstream. However, the main fate of lactate in skeletal muscle is that it sort of stays there because it's actually metabolized by the muscle itself. So what happens there is that you have fibers, for example, type 1 and type 2X next to each other. And the type 2X, because it's very, very fast and glycolytic, produces lactate. And the type 1, which is relatively slow and plenty of time, plenty of oxygen to do things, then takes the lactate and metabolizes it as a, normal, uh, as a normal energy substrate. So the majority of lactate, which is produced in the skeletal muscle, never leaves skeletal muscle. It's actually metabolized within skeletal muscle by, by other types of fibers, which do have the, uh, the enzymatic machinery and plenty of time to do that. Okay? So the majority of lactate never leaves. So the core cycle does exist, but it's really just for a relatively small portion of lactate which is produced in the muscle. Okay, so most of it uh, is metabolized directly there. Good. Okay, so that's all about glucose metabolism. And as we said, one of the main determinants of how much glucose will be used by the muscle is the load. Okay, so at very high load, plenty of glucose will be used. However, in kind of medium to low loads, okay, so we're talking... Uh, Usually in like sports medicine, uh, what we use to measure the intensity of a load is the fraction from maximum intensity, okay? Maximum load. So maximum load is 100%, okay? That's the maximum that the muscle can do. And then all the other loads are just described by percentages from the maximum, okay? So maximum load is something like 85% of maximum to 100%, okay? There, the muscles will be mostly using glucose, okay? All of them. What happens in lower loads? So as you're sitting here, most of your muscles are not really working very hard, okay? Some of your muscles are because they need to keep your posture so they don't you know, fall off the chair, but actually you're not working very, very hard. What are the main, or what is the main substrate for the muscle in this situation, for most skeletal muscles? Lipids, and more specifically, Okay, triacylglycerols, yeah. Oh. They need 
fatty acids, okay? Fatty acids, okay? Triacylglycerols is also sort of a good answer, but fatty acids, okay? So the majority of skeletal muscle, unless it's working very, very, very hard, is using, for most of its energy needs, it's, it's using fatty acids. Similar to glucose, where are these fatty acids coming from? Again, there are several possibilities. Okay, so they can be coming from the blood. Now, there are some free fatty acids in the blood, okay, not huge amounts. They increase when? When do free fatty acids increase in the blood? Lipolysis. Through lipolysis, but what situation? In starvation, okay, so when we haven't eaten, more fatty acids go into blood. But even when we have eaten, there are, there's, there are some levels of fatty acids in the blood. So, free fatty acids in the blood can go into the muscle. How do they get in? We talked about GLUT4 for glucose. How do they get in? They're fat transporters, very good. Or fatty acid transporters, uh, very good. The most famous one is called CD36, but now many other transporters for fatty acids have been identified. So for a very long time, and again in all the literature, you can find that fatty acids just diffuse through the membrane, which they can do, but apparently it's very, very slow. Okay? So we do have specific fatty acid transporters. This fat CD36 is one of them, probably the longest known one, and we need them to get an efficient flow of fatty acids into the muscle, okay? So one possible source are free fatty acids from the blood. Are there other sources of fatty acids that we can use? Are there other forms of fats in the blood? Apart from free fatty acids? Okay, and triacylglycerols are just floating there. Hmm? Well, the free fatty acids are from adipose tissue. Albumin is what? For triacylglycerols? For free fatty acids? Sure, yeah. Free fatty acids are bound to albumin. But there are other forms of... And the whole thing is called lipoproteins, okay? So the other possible source of fatty acids are lipoproteins. And the main ones are probably going to be either chylomicrons, but those really only appear in the blood when? Hmm? Yes, but they do go in, into the blood eventually, but only in certain situations in well-fed state after a meal, okay? That's when we have plenty of chylomicrons in the blood. But normally, the main lipoproteins are going to be VLDL, which are from the liver, okay? And this is, again, a bit of a revision, but how can we get fatty acids out of these lipoproteins? What do we need for that? So these lipoproteins contain triacylglycerols and phospholipids, et cetera, et cetera, cholesterol esters, and we need, to get free, we need to get fatty acids for the muscle. What do we need for that? And what lipase? Lipoprotein lipase, very good. Okay, so that's the other possible source of lipids for the muscle. There's lipoprotein lipase on the endothelium, which sucks free fatty acids out of these lipoproteins and they are transported into the, into the muscle fiber. There is a third source of fatty acids, of lipids, for the muscle. And it's similar to glycogen. As we said, glycogen is a storage form of glucose in the skeletal muscle. And in fact, and you may remember it from histology, there are actually lipid droplets inside muscle fibers. And that's a storage, that's lipid storage for the muscles, okay? They're called intramyocellular lipid droplets. Okay, and there are little droplets inside the, uh, the fiber. And of course, fatty acids can be released from them. They are usually called intramyocellular lipids or intramyocellular lipid droplets.
Okay, so our muscles do have actually quite significant store of lipids. Um, maybe if we had this lecture 10 years ago, I would have told you that these, these lipid droplets in the muscle are pathological. They are mostly found in diabetes patients, etc. Now we know that they are not at all pathological. They're actually very, very important for the normal function of, um, of skeletal muscle. So even highly trained athletes and marathon runners do have plenty of lipids inside their muscle fibers for obvious reasons because they knew, do need some store of, of energy for uh, some store of fatty acids for the, um, for the run or whatever. Yes? So can you the word of the Okay. Intra myocellular lipids or lipid droplets, okay? So inside the muscle cell, all right? Intramyocellular lipids. IMCL is the usual abbreviation. Yes? Do professional athletes uh, comparison to, I guess, normal people have more or less of the droplets? So uh, an untrained, healthy person would have the lowest amount of lipids, okay? A marathon runner will have a higher amount of lipids, and an obese patient with diabetes will also have a higher amount of lipids, okay? But of course, functionally, it's a very different situation, okay? But a, a, an untrained, healthy person has a relatively lower amount of them, right? Now, what is interesting, and it's gonna be the last thing about intramyocellular lipids, what is interesting is that all these fatty acids that come from the outside, first get esterified into triacylglycerols in these intramyocellular lipid droplets, and then they are released again and metabolized. Okay, it's, it's not 100% clear why that happens. It's probably in order to regulate properly the, the flow of fatty acids, so I'll say that again. These free fatty acids coming from lipoproteins or, or from, from the blood directly, they are not directly, they don't go directly into the mitochondrion to, to be metabolized, but in fact, they first go into the lipid droplets, they get synthesized into triacylglycerol, and then they are released again through lipolysis, and then metabolized, okay? It's probably because of regulation, this complicated system, but this is what's been, uh, what's been observed. All right. The last important substrate for muscles generally are of course amino acids. And the primary purpose of amino acids in the skeletal muscle is to regeneration, to, so to rebuild the, the proteins, the contractile proteins and the structural proteins, okay? That's the main reason why muscles take up amino acids, okay? Of course, we need all of them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there is a special group of amino acids with a special relationship with skeletal muscle. Branched chain amino acids. And what's so special about them with respect to skeletal muscle? Very good. So unlike most other nutrients which first go through the portal vein into the, li into the liver and are metabolized there and everything happens to them and then whatever is left goes into the circulation, branched chain amino acids flow through the liver without being touched, they go directly into the systemic circulation and they are indeed metabolized in the, uh, in the skeletal muscle. Now, I'm not gonna go into details about the metabolism, hopefully we did that last year or you can, you can find out how these, uh, how these um, uh, amino acids are metabolized. Some of the metabolic products are exported from the muscle and they go into the liver and can be used for all sorts of things. But of course, the muscle itself can use them either to build protein or to get some energy from them directly, okay, through the, the metabolic pathways of the, of the degradation. So the, the branch chain amino acids are actually used by skeletal muscle for all sorts of purposes. They're not just, sometimes you find in textbooks that they go into the skeletal muscle, they are transaminated decarboxyl and just go back into the liver, which is not quite what happens. Quite a lot of BCAAs actually start, uh, actually remain in the muscle and are used. What I actually want to talk about now is the other function of, of branch chain amino acids and some of the other essential amino acids. Apart from being a source of amino acids for building protein or the source of amino acids for 
various metabolic processes, they also serve as an important signal for the muscle. And it's a signal that tells the muscle to grow, that it can grow, okay? If there are enough essential amino acids, and a big part of that are branch amino acids, the, the muscle is assured that it has enough source material for, for, um, for protein synthesis and that it can grow. How does it work? Well, these essential amino acids switch on a second metabolic master switch. The first one was AMP kinase, and we talked about that. Okay, so that's a signal, not enough energy, we need to do something. And there is another metabolic master switch, which is called mTOR. You may have heard about mTOR last year. Does anyone know what it stands for? It's a weird abbreviation. It stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Rapamycin is an antibiotic. And in bacteria, it was discovered that there's a protein which is a target for rapamycin, so they call it TOR, and this is the mammalian form. Okay, it's a weird name. Um, but this protein, it's actually a big complex, signaling complex, is a master switch, is the second master switch for metabolism in all tissues, not just in the muscle. The activation of mTOR tells the cell there is plenty of everything. You can start growing, dividing, all sorts of things. Okay, so it's a very, very important in cancer, in all, <coughs> sorts of, in all sorts of situations. There are ways for mTOR to be activated by availability of amino acids. It's actually one of the main mechanisms of its activation. And this activated mTOR then tells the muscle fiber to grow, to start growing. Okay? So, Essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids are a very important signal for the skeletal muscle to grow. And in fact, if you give somebody a meal containing a lot of essential amino acids, or if you give them an infusion of essential amino acids, for about an hour or so, the synthesis of protein in the muscle increases. Okay, without any exercise, without anything. It just, the, the muscle just, oh, well, plenty of amino acids, let's, let's build something. But it only lasts for a relatively brief period of time and a lot of the newly built protein is then broken down, okay? So you don't really get huge muscles by just eating a lot of protein. However, if you mix it together with exercise, which activates AMP kinase, which activates calmodulin dependent kinases and all sorts of other signals, if you combine these signals together, then the muscle, muscle actually will start growing and you can see that in all sorts of training regimens. Good. The final thing before we have a short break is how can we detect in the blood when, those, when skeletal muscle or other types of muscles are damaged, okay? So this is a very brief thing about markers of uh, muscle damage. And you've heard about some of them last year already. Does anyone remember any marker of muscle damage? Creatine. Very good, so we have creatine kinase with creatine kinase, a very important enzyme. We talked about it last year. What does creatine kinase do? What is the purpose of the enzyme? It's not just in the muscle. It's actually all the cells have it. Okay. Okay, so it can take creatine phosphate and take the phosphate and put it onto, onto ATP, okay? So it switches, it transports the phosphate between creatine phosphate and ATP. And last year, if you remember, we talked about creatine kinase quite a bit, and we said that it's a very important mechanism how to get the high energy phosphate from mitochondria or other parts of the, of the cell, like glycolytic machinery, to the place where it's needed, because ATP itself cannot really diffuse in the cell. Okay, so when, when we talk about the nucleus, the mitochondria, okay? So when you imagine a cell looking like this, then ATP is produced here, or most of it anyway, and then we think that it just diffuses everywhere wherever it's needed. This is not true, it's impossible, okay? The cytoplasm of the cell is not a liquid, it's a very thick gel, and nothing can diffuse through it, basically. Maybe oxygen or water or something like that. But most molecules are very slow to diffuse. So this is impossible. This will not happen. 
we actually need to have special systems that allow the phosphate to go where it's needed. Okay, so in the skeletal muscle, how to get it from the mitochondrion to the myofibrils. And this is what creatine phosphate is for. Okay, so it actually, we talked about it last year, so maybe have a look at the lecture. Okay, we don't really have time to go through it again. Very good. Creatine kinase is a very important increased activity of creatine kinase in the body. is an important marker of damage to cells generally. Okay, we have various isoenzymes. So we have creatine kinase MM, which is specific, more or less specific for skeletal muscle. And then we have creatine kinase MB, which is more or less specific for the cardiac muscle. So we can distinguish which muscle is damaged. Then there's a third isoenzyme, which is called creatine kinase BB. B standing for brain, which is mostly neuronal, but it's also in other tissues. But we, we're usually not very interested in, the, in this isoenzyme. So creatine kinase, a very important marker of damage. All right. What other ones? Hmm? Troponins, very good. Troponins, usually we're looking at the cardiac specific troponins. So we're, we're looking at the troponins which are only from the, from the cardiac muscle. Okay, and either we look at troponin T or troponin I. And these are used to detect fairly specifically and fairly quickly the damage to cardiac muscle. And they are now one of the main diagnostic methods for detecting myocardial infarction. Okay, they do rise up very quickly. They are fairly specific to cardiac muscle. All right. The, well, one of the last markers that I want you to know, and you've heard all about it, is myoglobin. So when there is a large amount of damage to skeletal muscle, myoglobin will be released into the blood, and we can detect it. But it's not very sensitive. It's not very specific. It's not really used very much for detecting damage, but it can be. So myoglobin. Then there are some older markers like lactate dehydrogenase, which is also released from damaged muscles. But these days, it's not a really very good marker. It's very nonspecific because all tissues contain lactate dehydrogenase. So it could really be coming from anywhere. Good. Good, good, good. So let's have a five minute break and we'll continue with the bone. So clinically, you can measure these in the blood to find out what's happening if, if muscle is damaged, what kind of muscle is damaged. Okay, so these are clinically, bio, or in clinical biochemistry, these are markers you, we, we can use. All right, so five minute break. <coughs> right, so the bone itself, you know the structure, there is the inorganic part or the extracellular part, which is organic, inorganic, and then there are, yes? Question, what's that arrow supposed to point to? I don't know, I forgot already. Um, the arrow, the are yeah, that it's used in the muscle or something. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I draw things and then I forget. Uh, what can I use to erase that? Do you see the, the sponge somewhere? Oh, yeah. All right, so in, in the bone, we have the extracellular matrix and we have cells. What kind of cells do we have in the bone? Osteoblasts, very good. Osteocytes and osteoclasts, okay? You know that they have some different origins, okay, osteoclasts are originally... Hmm? From... Sorry, I just can't hear you. From monocytes, yeah, okay, so they're blood cells, okay, which then get transformed into these massive multinucleated cells that destroy the bone. Osteoblasts and osteocytes are some kind of mesenchymal cells, okay, so these two populations are separate, but some of the osteoblasts then differentiate into osteocytes. Okay, so these two types of cells are actually closely, rela closely related. What is the biggest population of cells in the bone? Of which cells there are the most of them? Osteocytes, do you know the percentages? Okay, something like 95% of all the cells in the bone are osteocytes. Okay, so even though we 
usually talk about osteoblasts and osteoclasts, they are actually just a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of all the cells in the bone, okay? Which makes sense, because where do we find osteoblasts and osteoclasts? Where in the bone? Not macroscopically, maybe, but... That's where the osteocytes are. But osteoblasts and osteoclasts are just on the surface of the bone. They're not inside the bone. They're just on the surface. I mean, also the inner surface, but, but they're not inside the actual bone. They're just on the surface. Okay, so that's why the majority of all the cells are osteocytes, okay, which are actually inside the bone, okay, in the Heversin systems. All right. Now, uh, the reason why we almost never talk about osteocytes is that until recently they were basically impossible to study. Okay? Getting a live osteocyte out of this hard substance of the bone was nearly impossible and actually studying them in situ while they are there was completely impossible. Okay? So for a long time people didn't know anything about osteocytes. In all the textbooks, you will find that osteocytes are just sitting there, basically. Okay? They are metabolically inactive. They are, in the signaling way, they're inactive. They're just sitting there. Okay? They're kind of leftover osteoblasts, osteoblasts. Now, in the past five years, a lot has been discovered about the functions of osteocytes, and clearly, they are the most important cells in the, in the bone. They are what actually makes the bone what signals to all the other cells whether the bone needs to be built up, whether it needs to be degraded. So they are really the hub of all, everything that is happening in, uh, inside the cell, okay? And this is often in science, what you can study easily, those are the things that we know a lot about, even though they may not be very important, but those things that are very hard to study, we know nothing about them, even though they might be very, very important. So, so if we look at the bone, at the surface, we can have osteoblasts, and then where bone is degraded, we can have these multi-nucleated osteoclasts, okay? And then inside the bone, we have these relatively boring looking, but very important osteocytes, okay? Does the scheme make sense? What did I just do there? Very good. Now, the bone, of course, is continuously, under normal conditions, is continuously being rebuilt and remodeled. What is the main signal, normally, under normal conditions, that tells the bone to rebuild itself? What do you think it could be? Just kind of thinking about what the function of the bone is. Very good. I wouldn't call it damage, but the pressures and tensions, okay? So if we, for example, uh, change our posture, okay? And suddenly we start, for whatever reason, because of an injury or something, we change our posture and we start walking different, differently, the bones will perceive the change in tension and pressure and will rebuild themselves in order to work properly, okay? To actually you know, build more of the bone where there is more pressure, okay, so that it doesn't break or something like that. So one of the main signals for bone remodeling under normal conditions is sensing pressure, tension, etc., in the bone. What are the cells that detect these things? Well, not surprisingly, they are osteocytes. So all the osteocytes, which in fact, and that's also something that I'm not sure is mentioned very clearly in histology lessons and elsewhere, all the osteocytes are actually connected to each other, okay? So they do have these little uh, processes, these little projections, and they are connected by gap junctions, okay? So similar to, for example, cardiomyocytes, which are connected by gap junctions forming effectively one big system of connected cells, it's similar to osteocytes. So they're all connected to each other, they're communicating with each other, and they also have mechanosensing uh, channels which detect pressures and they tell all the other osteocytes, well, there is more pressure coming in, we have to start doing something about the structure of the bone. Now they also secrete signals to osteoblasts and to osteoclasts. 
Again, that's the mechanism through which we can remodel uh, the bone. Now, the most important signal which tells the bone, well, which tells osteoclasts to start, start degrading the bone, is a molecule called rankle. Rankle, which stands for receptor activator of NF-kappa B ligand. Horrible, horrible, horrible name. You don't really need to know that. Okay, just remember that it's rankle. And this rankle molecule binds to receptors which are called rank. Okay, so rank are the receptors and rank co are the, the, is the ligand that binds to them. Okay, so rankle is a signal for osteoclasts start breaking down the bone. And it can come, for example, actually the majority of rankle comes from osteocytes because they send some pressure and they have to, uh, they have to um, remodel the bone, all right? So rankle is the main source. Why do I keep talking about it? Well, nowadays, well, obviously you've heard about osteoporosis, which is a major problem for elderly people, especially women, but not just women. And it's something that creates a huge amount of problems. So looking for drugs that can actually interfere with, with breaking down bone, which, which would slow down breaking down bone is very important. Now we have, uh, and they are in clinical practice, we have antibodies against rankle, okay, which are used for, to treat osteoporosis. Okay, very special kinds of osteoporosis. They can also be used to treat uh, bone metastases. So when cancer goes into the bone and starts destroying the bone, by blocking rankle, we can actually slow down the, uh, the, the breakdown of the bone, which is extremely painful, etc. Okay, So I can tell you that it's called denosumab. You don't need to know that, but if you're really interested, that's a drug that can block rankle. Again, those are things that were discovered in the last maybe 10 years or something. It's very, very new things, but already there are drugs that can be, um, that can be used in this. Now, there is another signaling molecule which comes from osteocytes and can also come from osteoblasts. In fact, osteoblasts can also secrete rankle, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, and the other signal is called OPG or osteoprotegerine. So it protects the bone, osteoprotegerine, okay, protects the bone, okay. And this is a signal that goes against the signal of rankle. Actually, OPG looks like the rank receptor. So OPG looks like rank receptor, but it's not a receptor. It's just secreted into the, into the extracellular fluid. So it binds rankle but doesn't create any signal. It's a decoy receptor. Does it make sense? Okay? It's a fake receptor. Okay? So it binds rankle and stops it from acting because it's a receptor which is not really connected to any signaling cascade. But you said it affects osteoblasts, isn't it? I didn't say that. It's just a badly drawn uh, arrow. Okay? I just used an arrow that I drew for something else. It, it doesn't really affect osteoblasts. But does, in fact, but in a very complicated way, all right? So osteoprotegerine is a contra signal to rankle, okay? So basically, one of the main uh, factors that determines whether a piece of bone is going to be degraded or rebuilt is the balance between osteoprotegerine and rankle. And this balance is determined, first of all, by the sensing of osteocytes, which detect, okay, we need to build it here, or we need to, re we need to remove it here, or something. But the other factor, which determines this ratio between osteoprotegerine and rankle, is a hormone, one of the most important hormones, to change the metabolism of the bone, which would be... Hmm? The third one. <laughs> It's not calcitonin, it's not calcitriol. We'll talk about those as well, but the most important one is 
the parathormone. So what is, the, what is the purpose of parathormone? Do you remember? What is the main function of parathormone? It's not really to break, break down bones because, yeah. I mean, you're right that it does break down bones and we'll see that in a second how, how it does that, but that's not really the purpose of it, okay? Ideally, we would keep our bones as strong as possible, okay? But in some situations, for example, when we don't have enough calcium, we have to break them down. So the purpose of parathormone, the main function of parathormone, is to increase the concentration of calcium in the blood. Okay, that's what that's the signal. Okay, now uh, parathormone has a lot, a, a lot of varied functions. Okay, it can increase the uh, the uptake of calcium from the intestines and also in the in the kidneys, but it also acts on the bone. And here it acts both on the osteoblasts and on the osteocytes and increases the secretion of rankel. Okay? So once again, parathormone activates both osteoblasts and osteocytes to increase the production of rankel, so indirectly it acts on osteoclasts to start breaking down the bone and release calcium. Does it make sense? Okay. So this is this is the the main effect of parath effect of parathormone onto the bone. However, when people started looking at the function of parathormone, they found out that it can have two completely opposite functions on the bone. And I'm not going to go into details why that is so. But if you give parathormone at a fairly high dose continuously, it will start breaking down bone. Okay, so this is the normal function, normal function of parathormone. However, if you give parathormone at a low dose and not continuously, but only in one dose a day, and then nothing, and then one dose a day and nothing, it actually starts building up the bone. So it's osteoanabolic in, these, in this different type of dosage. It's weird, nobody really understands quite how it fits into the normal regulation. However, and that's the reason why I'm talking about it, now, and it's a very recent thing, we can use parathormone to treat osteoporosis as well. And it's counterintuitive because you would say, well, if you give somebody parathormone, their bones are going to be broken down faster. Yes, that is true, but only if you give parathormone continuously. If you give it in low doses, once a day, it actually starts building up the bone. Okay? And it's the only treatment that we have currently that can actually build up the bone. All the other treatments for osteoporosis just stop the breakdown. But giving low dose of parathormone can, can build up bone. Yep. Uh, it's a little bit complicated and we don't really have time to go into that. But first of all, it's, it's about this, this ratio of osteoprotegerine and rankle but also there is a feedback communication between osteoclasts and osteoblasts, which actually creates a more complicated uh, communication pattern. That, and also the parathormone receptors, depending on how long they are activated, they activate different genes in the cell. It's fairly complex. Yes? How does osteoporosis happen anyway? Is there um, a decrease in OPT? Or? Well, um, the pathogenesis of osteoporosis is fairly complex. Okay, um, we'll get to, uh, so one of the reasons why women mostly suffer from osteoporosis is that estrogens are a very important osteoanabolic hormone. And after menopause, estrogen levels go down, okay? There are no other osteoanabolic hormones there in the body, and that's why the, the support of the rebuilding and, and keeping the bone, uh, bone tissue uh, is removed, and that's why, that's why there, is, there is a, an increased propensity to decrease bone mass. The other reason is that often people, older people, don't have enough physical activity. So these pressure stimuli that normally tell the bone to keep you know, doing its thing are not there very much. Okay, so that's another reason. Uh, there is uh, diet, 
diet influences quite a bit how bone is remodeled, the availability of calcium, the availability of vitamin D, etc. It's, it's a relatively complex uh, problem. Right. Um, since we talked about parathormone, somebody mentioned the other hormone that deals with calcium, which is calcitonin. <coughs> now, calcitonin has receptors on osteoclasts and directly inhibits the function. Okay, so calcitonin directly binds to osteoclasts and inhibits their function. This way, it blocks the, de the degradation of the bone. And again, we can use calcitonin to treat, for example, cancer metastases in the bone. Well, it mostly relieves the pain, not so much the degradation of the bone. Nobody knows why it relieves the pain, but it's used anyway. Uh, but there are direct receptors on osteoclasts. Now, the weird thing about calcitonin is that nobody knows what its physiological function is. Nobody knows why we need calcitonin at all, okay? Because usually in textbooks, you hear that calcitonin is there to basically decrease the amount of calcium in the body, but it can't do that. All it can do is to stop the degradation of the bone, okay? It can't really get rid of calcium, okay? So scientists actually made uh, mice that do not produce any calcitonin, and the mice were perfectly normal. Okay, they didn't have any problems at all, okay? The current hypothesis, what calcitonin actually does is that it's a counter-regulatory hormone. If we don't have enough calcium, okay, in the diet, for example, then there are a lot of signals, parathormone, vitamin D, etc., that start pulling calcium from the bones. And it looks like calcitonin is there only to stop overdoing it. Okay, so it's a break that the body can put on this pulling of, of calcium into the, um, uh, into the blood from the bones. It's not very clear, but this is the current hypothesis what calcitonin is actually, uh, is actually for. However, if you have enough calcium in your diet and you don't have any other problems, then calcitonin is basically doesn't need to be there. It doesn't really seem to be doing anything under normal conditions. That's quite an interesting thing. Um, I already mentioned estrogen as another hormone, which is very important. And of course, as you, of course, as you know, it's not only women that produce estrogens, men have estrogen as well, okay? Actually, quite high levels of estrogen. Um, so estrogen does have a lot of different effects on, the, uh, on this whole signaling system. And one of, the, one of the things that it does is that it increases the production of, of osteoprotegerine, okay? So it really stops the, the degradation of the bone and increases the growth of the bone, okay? But it actually has effects in all over the place. It, it has a lot of different um, effects. Very important osteoanabolic hormone. The final hormone I want to talk about is calcitriol or vitamin D. We're almost at the end now, so bear with me. Uh, calcitriol, uh, what are the effects of calcitriol, the main effects? Does anyone remember from last year? Very good, okay, so the main effect is, is to increase the amount of calcium transporters in the gut and also in the kidneys to, basic, to basically get more calcium into the, um, into the body. Now, in the bone, the effects of calcitriol are very, very complex, okay? Uh, what seems to happen, and that's why I left it at the end, what seems to happen is that under conditions where you have enough calcium, when there's plenty of calcium in your diet, calcitriol will increase the amount of bone mass. So it will actually help the building of new bone and maybe slightly decrease the breakdown. However, if you don't have enough calcium in your diet, calcitriol will work the other way around. 
it will start degrading the bone in order to get more calcium into the body. So similar to parathormone. Okay? So this is, but as I said, the function of calcitriol on the bone is not very well understood. Okay? So this is the current hypothesis, what is, what is probably happening. Um, but I think a lot of research needs to be put into that. Good. The final bit that I want to talk about uh, with regards to bone are again the markers of bone metabolism. So in clinical biochemistry, how we can uh, detect um, changes in the bone, whether it's being built up or whether it's being degraded. Now, we haven't really talked very much about the composition of the bone. I assume that that's something you've heard before, you can quite easily find. But in fact, most of the markers of bone metabolism are bits of the, um, of the extracellular matrix of the bone, basically. Okay? So, or the enzymes that are related to that, uh, related to that. So we have markers of bone buildup, of a growth of a new bone. So markers of growth, and then we have markers of degradation. Probably the oldest but still currently used marker of bone growth is alkaline phosphatase. Okay, we had a practical together, didn't we? Or do we have it? Yeah. yeah. Alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme which, whose function is interestingly unknown. Um, nobody knows what it actually does in the bone on elsewhere or elsewhere. It's present in many other tissues, so it's not, as a whole, it's not very specific. But here, we detect the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, which is actually a very good marker of how the, the bone is growing because ALP is expressed in osteoblasts. Okay? So it's an enzyme which is quite in high concentration in osteoblasts. So if osteoblasts are very active, more bone ALP will be released into the bloodstream and we can detect it there. What it actually does in the osteoblasts, nobody knows. But it's a very good and very important marker. Uh, the other marker of bone growth are what's called collagen propeptides. You may recall from last year that the synthesis of collagen is fairly complex. There are a lot of steps, okay? And one of the early steps in the production of collagen is that peptides on the, on the um, uh, N-terminus and the C-terminus are cut off in order to make basically pro-collagen, okay? Now, these propeptides are released into the bloodstream and we can detect them as a marker of how much new collagen is being produced. Okay. It's a marker that's used clinically, although it can be a little bit uh, confusing in some situations because some of the collagen that is being produced is then immediately broken down. So we can overestimate the amount of collagen that is actually being, being synthesized by, by using these, uh, these pro-collagen propeptides. Uh, and the third marker of bone growth, that's going to be the last one, is osteocalcin. Does anyone remember anything about osteocalcin? So osteocalcin is a protein in the extracellular matrix of the bone, and it's there, it's, it's, it's secreted by osteoblasts, and it's there because it binds calcium and it allows the, uh, the precipitation of hydroxyapatite. Okay? Osteocalcin is quite interesting because, as some other calcium binding proteins in the body, it needs a special vitamin to be produced. Does anyone remember what vitamin we need to produce proteins that can bind calcium? These other proteins are in a completely different system, but they also bind calcium and they need this vitamin. No. We need vitamin C to build collagen, that's true, but not for this. Are there any proteins in the blood 
that bind calcium. And it's very important for the function. Without calcium, they will not function. If we remove calcium from the blood, what doesn't happen? Coagulation, right? Coagulation factors bind calcium and they need vitamin K, right? So this is just a connection to a completely different chapter, but osteocalcin as a calcium binding protein also requires vitamin K in order to be synthesized because it contains the same structure as in all those vitamin K dependent co coagulation factors. It contains gamma carboxy, gamma carboxy glutamate. So basically glutamate, sorry, glutamate with two COO minus groups. Okay, glutamate normally has only one CO minus, well it has two, but the other one is connected to the chain. And vitamin K can add another one, and this structure binds calcium. So this is the same in coagulation <laughs> factors and in osteocalcin. Very final bit in the last minute are the, uh, the markers of, of bone degradation. Some of the oldest ones are, for example, hydroxyproline, because you will remember that in collagen, in the post-translational post modifications, proline is hydroxylated. So when this collagen is then broken down, hydroxyproline is released into the blood and into the urine, and we can detect it there. It's a relatively old marker, and it's not used as much as it used to be, because it's not very specific for the bone because all the other collagens also contain hydroxyproline, so you, know, you don't know what, which collagen is being broken down. And also, it's not very specific for the uh, breakdown of the bone, because some of the newly synthesized collagen is also broken down. So it's, it's, it's not a great marker, but it's one of the, uh, it's one of the uh, oldest ones. The other marker are collagen telopeptides. So we had pro-collagen or collagen propeptides, which are the marker of new collagen. And here we have collagen telopeptides, which are basically just bits of collagen that have been broken down and released into, into the bloodstream. The, the final, well, two markers, um, pyridinoline, pyridinoline and deoxypyridinoline sounds a bit weird, but in fact, if you remember from the synthesis of collagen, that those lysines using lysyl oxidase form these cross bridges with some strange structures there. So basically, deoxypyridinoline and pyridinoline are these bridges that have been cut out from collagen and released into the bloodstream, okay? And these are, in fact, very good markers because deoxypyridinoline is very specific to the bone collagen. final marker of bone breakdown is called TRAP, which stands for tartrate resistant acidic phosphatase. Tartrate resistant acidic phosphatase, which is basically the enzyme that is released from osteoclasts to break down the, extra, so the inorganic matrix. Okay? So this enzyme is actually a pretty good marker of how many of the activity of osteoclasts in the bone. So tartrate-resistant acidic phosphatase. And that's it. Do you have any questions? Yes? Um, when you were mentioning the markers of bone growth, yes? you talked about alkaline phosphatase. Yes. You said that the more active the osteoclasts, the higher, and then you mentioned a substance or something. No. Uh, so, so since ALP is, is being secreted, it's actually in the osteoblast, Basically, the more bone ALP, the more osteoblastic activity. Okay, no more questions? All right, okay, well, thanks.